As we saw last week, the term fixture has a very particular meaning for capital allowances purposes, and that differs from the looser concept of fixtures and fittings that is used for accounting purposes. So really, the first rule when approaching a capital allowances analysis is to ensure that we don't miss out on fixtures that are shown in the accounts under the heading of land and buildings. This principle also links, incidentally, to another key point concerning capital gains tax. We'll look at CGT in detail in a later talk, but it's worth making the point here that a claim for capital allowances does not lead to an increased capital gain. For a newly built property, the actual costs of construction, excluding the land cost, can be analysed into various categories. The approach to take will depend on the size of the project and on the quality of the paperwork. There may, for example, be a simple spreadsheet analysis of the building costs, or for larger projects there may be a bill of quantities together with a schedule of variations. One way or the other, we need to begin with a breakdown of the costs. A capital allowances claim will typically be prepared by creating a spreadsheet with, I suggest, at least five columns. These will include a description of the expenditure in question, the total cost, the non-qualifying elements, and there will always be some of those, the parts that qualify as standard rate expenditure, and the costs qualifying as special rate expenditure, mainly integral features. Some projects will include expenditure on green assets designed to reduce the consumption of either power or water. A sixth column may be needed in that case, as these may qualify for enhanced capital allowances, whereby all the costs are relieved at the outset by way of 100% first-year allowances. When carrying out the analysis, there may be no need to break down some large elements. The cost of the walls and roof, for example, will not normally qualify at all, so there's no need for any detailed analysis. The cost of toilets and basins will qualify in full as standard rate expenditure, and again it may not be necessary to include much detail. By contrast, the electrical costs may need to be broken down, so that, for example, the general lighting costs are allocated to the heading of special rate expenditure, whereas computer wiring and the whole cost of any alarm systems will normally qualify in full as standard expenditure. Other categories of expenditure will then be allocated to the various headings as appropriate. Most projects will include preliminary and overhead costs as well as a variety of professional fees. Now the rule here is that a proportionate amount of time should be spent to allocate these costs to the correct headings. In some cases it will be clear that the costs do not qualify at all. This would be the case, for example, for legal costs incurred on purchasing the land on which the property has been built. By contrast, the professional fees charged by a mechanical engineer may qualify in full, though it will sometimes be necessary to apportion them between standard and special rate expenditure. Other fees should be apportioned pro rata to the various categories of qualifying and non-qualifying expenditure, unless there are good grounds for any other approach. The upper-tier tribunal in the Weatherspoon case unhesitatingly agreed that a pro rata approach should be used where a detailed item-by-item -item attribution would be disproportionately time-consuming or expensive. Once the analysis has been made, the resulting figures should be merged with any other qualifying expenditure in the various categories. Annual investment allowances can be claimed as appropriate, subject to the usual rules.